Happy holidays. It's uh, a pleasure to be with you today. And it's certainly a busy time of year. And it's also one of my favorite times of the year. We've got a great lineup for you today. Uh, I think you're going to really enjoy Tom Sullivan for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We also have Congresswoman Nancy Mace and then Charlie Stone with Beaufort County Economic Development. Also this morning, we were able to secure uh, kind of a last minute deal, a specialist in logistics, supply chain, and transportation that we'll have on towards the end of the show. And I hope you'll be able to stick around to uh, hear some of this uh, uh, advice that we'll get then. Well, this Friday, it's time again for Sparkles and Spirits. Um, Sparkles and Spirits is sold out once again this year, which we're, we're thrilled about. I'm sorry if you don't have your tickets next year, you want to get them just a little bit earlier. But I do have good news, and that is their silent auction is still alive and going, and there's some great gifts and trips and giveaways there that I would encourage you to go on to the website and take a look at and see if you have any interest in doing that. And Kelly's going to place a link in the chat box so, so you'll be able to do that, or you can also go to HiltonHeadBluftonChamber.org. Please welcome a guy that uh, really needs no introduction. He could certainly teach us a thing or two, a thing or two about uh, transportation, traffic, and, and other things. It's a busy time for he and, his, he and his elves at the North Pole, but uh, as of this morning, he was able to break away and spend just a little bit of time with us this morning. So, Santa, welcome. We're glad to have you today. Oh, ho, 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 Bill. I'm glad to be here. And if we get the, get the video going well, and you can see a beautiful view of Broad Creek and the ICW in the back, because I've just toured through Hilton Head, and there are some wonderful local shops here that will have all kinds of gifts that you can buy for your spouses or maybe the uh, children's teachers that uh, would like a little appreciation gift. And you know, if you buy local, you're going to get things instantly that you can see and you know exactly what they are. And you've got the idea, in fact, that many of them are designed and made right here in Hilton Head and Bluffton. So it's a magnificent opportunity to shop in our many uh, shopping districts through uh, Caligny and Shelter Cove and Shelter Cove Town Center and all the other areas of the island. Santa, it's so good to see your face. Just a couple of quick questions for you that uh, our audience is interested in. Uh, hot chocolate or milk, which do you prefer? Well, I like hot chocolate. And that helps, you know, when you're riding around in the sleigh, it's just a little bit chilly and that hot chocolate does well. And, you know, a, a, a cookie is good, too, although I have learned that you can only eat so many cookies. And so I carry a little bag with me and uh, any cookies that I can't eat, I take to children who maybe wouldn't have any cookies of their own. Well, Santa, thank you so much for being with us. We know it's a busy time of year for you, and uh, we look forward, as well as as well as children all around the world, to see you in about, uh, I guess it'd be 18 days. That's right. Merry Christmas, Bill. Stay on the good list. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Safe, safe travel, Santa. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, tis the season to shop. And once again this year, we were champion for this year's Small Business Saturday. It's a welcome tradition here in the low country. And there are 51 million Americans who shopped on the Saturday after Thanksgiving. It's, uh, it's a lot of people. And here to talk more about that, the impact of holiday spending on small business and give us an update from Washington on small business is Tom Sullivan. Tom is the Vice President of Small Business Policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and a tireless advocate for your business and all businesses on Capitol Hill and in the White House. He runs the U.S. Chamber's Small Business Council, engaging those members on, regu on a regular basis to increase small business input and involvement. Tom also served under President George W. Bush as the highest ranking government official charged with exclusively advocating the view and needs of small business before government agencies and Congress. Tom, welcome. We're uh, delighted to have you back with us today. And we're looking forward to hearing your update on uh, 
on small business and the economy. How are things going for you, Bill, this morning? Oh, things are things are going well. It's another great day on Hilton Head Island and in Bluffton, and everybody's excited about the Christmas season. Well, I, I actually am so excited. I'm still perspiring. So uh, I will I would love to just jump right into a couple of slides to share with your team. Um, so I'll go through them real quick. We've got the question of, of the hour, uh, for me at least, is how are small businesses doing? Now, I, I'm actually, I am thrilled to be able to share with you, Bill, some information that no one else has seen yet. So please don't use Twitter and social media to promote this stuff until next week. But I want to give uh, your membership and the folks that are on this Power Hour a sneak peek at how small businesses are doing. We're going to release this report in full on December 14th. So how are small businesses doing? I think it's it really going to be no surprise to your membership uh, that, that it's tough out there. Um, inflation is, is a, a significant headwind. Um, and we see actually our small business index staying the same as Q3, third quarter. So what does that mean? Well, that means that this last holiday shopping season is even more important for small businesses to make up missed revenue uh, that they may have been struggling with throughout the, the whole year. So that's what this, this slide shows. It shows the index over uh, since 2017, obviously that enormous uh, dip at the beginning of the pandemic. And then we see it creeping up slightly, but as far as how things are going right now in this fourth quarter, it's the same as last quarter. And that means that those inflationary headwinds are hitting small businesses really hard. Let's dig down a little bit deeper into uh, what this means and what small businesses are facing. So we see, again, inflation. Last quarter, we heard from 70% of small businesses that said the worst is yet to come. And so really that prediction, unfortunately, has come true in this quarter, the inflation has ticked slightly up as far as a concern. We have concerns over inflation, the highest they've ever been in our small business index. We also see small businesses really trying to figure out and struggle how high they can raise costs. Because, Bill, I, I'm sure you know and your members know, it's not as easy as just flipping a switch to raise prices. There's actually a very complex relationship between prices and customer, whether that's business to business or business to consumer. And small businesses are raising prices, but it's a struggle. And it's a struggle not only to understand how much that price increase could be borne by their customers, but also a struggle in how to implement those price increases. Now, the good news, because uh, I, I think folks are starving for some good news. The good news is that even with inflation concerns at an all-time high for small business, that has not dampened the charitable giving in the small business community. And so we see, uh, we actually see over three quarters of small businesses encouraging their own employees to shop small, shop local, because as you know, Bill, uh, the highest percentage of a dollar stays in that local community when you shop small. And so we're excited about that charitable feeling on Main Street, as well as that philanthropic sense that is really um, coexists with the small business community. Now, when we shift at more good news, which is the increase of small businesses after the pandemic, it really is a remarkable slide. We have national picture on the left and a South Carolina picture on the right. That national picture, we see that applications for new businesses actually started taking off only four months after the start of the pandemic. Now you compare this to the recession of 2008, 2009, it took 10 years 
to start new business applications going on the uptick. It only took four months after the pandemic. And we see this good news as far as new business applications continuing. As you can see on the right, uh, you, I, I apologize, I put it in Helvetica 5, I think, font. But you can see that in July 2020 in South Carolina, there are over 9,000 new business applications. That's even higher in May. You can see that spike um, with new business applications. It's leveled off a little bit, but we still see South Carolina as far as new business applications. You're up 4.8% compared to last year. So the good news continues as far as small bit, uh, more and more people wanting to actually be their own boss and, and start their own business. And what are we doing to try to encourage that? Well, we're certainly working with our partners like the Hilton Head, Bluffton Chamber of Commerce. Bill, you and you know 2,000 other of your clones who run wonderful chambers of commerce across the country, we're joining together to convince Congress and the White House when it comes to small business, let's try not to micromanage an economic recovery. And so what we've tried to do is we tried to wrap our arms around, well, what does that mean? We came up with five principles that we're calling the Small Business Bill of Rights. And basically this tells Congress, like, let us hire and manage our own employees. Don't pass federal laws that micromanage how we hire and manage our employees. Let us establish contracts with other businesses. Let us be protected from frivolous lawsuits. And let me determine who I can sell or pass my business onto. Don't let the Federal Trade Commission swoop in and say, well, you know, that business that you're thinking of selling to, it's too big, so they can't purchase you. That makes no sense. That is anti-free enterprise and small businesses do not want the federal government to micromanage how they sell or pass on their, their business. Last and not least, Bill, and this is something that I've heard from you and I've heard from many small businesses around the country. Let small businesses have a legitimate seat at the table when the federal government is considering rules and regulations that affect their bottom line. So we are trying to put this in front of as many newly elected members of Congress as we can. And I was told recently uh, on a conference call with a, a member of Congress that this makes sense because small businesses want the federal government to be a wheelbarrow, not a wall when it comes to how they, they interact with small businesses. So we're excited about rolling that out with the new Congress. And last but not least, Bill, this really, I think, became a huge priority for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in partnership with you and, and your colleagues across the country. And that is providing you, providing chambers of commerce with resources, not only for you to pass on to your small business members, but also small business owners themselves have access to tools, tips, information for them to learn from their peers in the small business community, learn what some of this federal government stuff means. And so we are, we are doubling down on that effort. We have our small business digital platform called CO, that's C-O, and it's very easy to find, uschamber.com forward slash C-O. That provides tools, tips, information for small businesses. We're doubling down on our information dissemination because we believe that small businesses need to devote their attention to running their business not necessarily trying to figure out how the federal government works. That's our job. We want to pass along that information to small businesses for their benefit. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. I know that I ran through that really fast, but I got so excited to follow Santa Claus, I just can't help myself. So Bill, happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right. All right, Tom. Thank you. And uh, Santa Claus is a tough act to follow, but you're pretty, you're pretty good yourself. We have... We have some questions from our members. The first one's coming from Margaret. And Margaret is asking, how are small businesses managing when it comes to attracting talent with, to compete with larger companies? Well, Margaret, thank you for that question. And it's a question I, I, I get a lot. Um, so small businesses are desperate for new employees. And what I 
what I've heard more and more is the advice to lean into your smallness. I know it sounds a little bit silly, but let me explain what it means. It means that small businesses have a unique advantage over some of their larger competitors to be community leaders, to be face-to-face -face with customers and consumers. So what I'm seeing more and more of is that small businesses are leaning into that community to actually uh, access qualified and willing employees. I'll give you an example of a wonderful small business owner in Jackson, Mississippi, Jeff Good. So Jeff owns uh, three restaurants in Jackson, Mississippi. And now when he greets customers at his premier restaurant, instead of taking their drink order, he looks at the father or the mother and says, you know, if any of your children are interested in working here in my restaurant, I'll take good care of them. And then he turns to, if there's family members there, he hands them an actual job description of working at their restaurant and says, hey, look this over. And I'd love to love to be your boss. I'd love to teach you about the restaurant industry a little bit. It's a great it's a great job. We'd love to have you on board. And, and it's that type of uniqueness that small businesses can offer when it comes to uh, attracting, hiring, and keeping qualified and willing employees. So my advice to more and more small businesses: lean into the uniqueness of being small to compete for those best employees. All right, Tom, thank you for that answer. And uh, the next question is coming from Jeff. And Jeff is asking, besides visiting brick and mortar stores, how else can we support small businesses? Well, thank you, Bill. Um, so visiting is now really a, a multifaceted explanation. So you could visit brick and mortar in person. You could visit sometimes online and then make a decision. And then at the end of the day, my teenage uh, my teenage boys tell me, you know, post post your best uh, places to go and shop on Instagram. I'm still trying to figure that out, but I, I'm getting the hang of it. So the type of promotion that goes beyond just telling your neighbor or the person you go to church with um, now actually is even more available through technology. Another thing that that we're really starting to dig into with some of our larger business members is a look at their relationship on a B2B side with small business suppliers. And we're starting to look at how that relationship is mutually beneficial and how some of those larger businesses can help that small business supply chain. For instance, if you've got uh, net terms for invoice payments, can a larger business look at perhaps paying that small supplier a little faster than they have before? Is that actually frees up some capital in that small business supplier? Is the small business supplier looking to scale to be a larger supplier for that business? Are there financing opportunities that the larger business may be able to provide that small business uh, supplier in order to do that? So we're just now looking at that type of approach. And uh, I'd love, Bill, I'd love to hear from you and some of your membership on what they think of this concept of a a, a quicker invoice payment system that helps actually bolster the small business supply chain. Love to hear from you and from others on whether you think that that's a good idea going forward. That, uh, that sounds very interesting and thank you for that. We'll certainly get with our members and, and provide, provide some feedback on, on uh, what they're thinking regarding that. Thank you. Tom, it's always great to see you. Thank you for being with us. We know you've got a busy day ahead of you and uh, appreciate you joining in and all you do for small business. Thank you, Bill. And sorry for being a little bit late. I hope this doesn't get me on the Santa, Santa bad list. <laughs> I think you're still on the good list. You keep Thank working you. for small business, you'll be on the good list. Thanks, Bill. All right. That was Tom Sullivan with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We're going to transition now. To, uh, she was just reelected to her second term in Congress, and Congresswoman Nancy Mace is with us this morning to give us her take on what to expect in Washington, uh, what her priorities are for the coming year, and also for those of you who may not be familiar with Congressman Mace's background, she's the first female graduate of the Citadel. She knows small business. Why? Because she's run one, and she's a mom, and she's very, very passionate and an advocate for the Low Country. Congresswoman Mace, welcome. We're glad to have you this morning. Happy holidays. 
Good morning. It's good to see you as well and appreciate everyone's time and tuning in today. Uh, We're in the throes of the end of the year. Lame duck session is, is what it's called. And uh, we're going to be up here for the next two weeks, maybe even up until Christmas Eve, trying to iron out whether it's funding um, or other pieces of legislation, trying to get them through before the end of the year. I am very excited about Republicans having the majority next year in the House. The only problem with that plan is that Democrats run and rule the Senate. And the, the, the opportunity I see there for us as a state is that it's gonna force us to work together. If you wanna deliver results for the state of South Carolina, you have to be willing and able to reach across the aisle and be an effective leader during some very divisive times. And uh, I'm excited about that because as a, in the, as a Republican in the minority in my first term in office, we were able to pass over 20 bills at a committee, over 10 out of the floor of the house and showcasing that even though we disagree on the majority of things, there are things that we can work together on to uh, deliver results for our respective districts and our respective states. Um, one of the other things that uh, is gonna, I think important for us and for the Low Country is that I will have a gavel on oversight. I'll be one of five chairmen, only five chairmen. The last time South Carolina had a chairman on over, a subcommittee chairman on oversight, it was Trey Gowdy. And so that's a great development to have someone in leadership over there overseeing the waste, fraud, and abuse that happens at the federal level. I mean, businesses, as you know, when uh, that sort of thing happens, you either fix it or you go under. <clears throat> but the federal government, funded by historic revenues from taxpayers, they can do really whatever they want. And so it's our job to sort of clean up that mess. And I'm excited, looking forward to doing that as well. The priorities of Congress, as far as I've been able to see from our Republican leadership, is addressing the issues of inflation. That's going to have to include the supply chain, uh, for sure. Ensuring that our defense and our military is funded, uh, serving our veterans, that's going to be, those are important issues. Looking at the border, we cannot ignore what's going on at the border. It's affecting South Carolina communities, the fentanyl crisis, whether it's exposure to law enforcement who are doing drug busts or people trying to bring it illegally into our state, kids that are dying from it. Um, that's another issue as well. And, and there are some social issues that we're going to have to address, whether or not that is a priority of leadership uh, is still to be determined. But I can tell you in the low country, um, after Roe v. Wade was overturned, that was a huge issue to constituents on what are the next steps. And all eyes are really on the state to see what they do and trying to show some leadership to bring people together on some even the most controversial issues. And so um, I'm excited about you know, continuing the work that we started. I filed a lot of bills this session. We're gonna file even more next time. We passed a lot of bills. We're gonna try to get even more next time. We were great at grant funding, about 50 million or more each year, last year and this year, it's over a hundred million dollars via grant funding here in the district. And uh, more recently, one of our more recent grants we helped get funded was at the Hilton Head Island Airport, over $11 million for that project. <clears throat> for part of the expansion project, we've done some cyber, help get some cyber security grants <clears throat> down there in Beaufort. But um, you know, working really hard and uh, appreciate everyone's support and ideas. Our office is always open. We love to hear from people and um, you know, just appreciate your time today too. Congresswoman, thank you, and uh, congratulations on with your leadership role on the Oversight Committee. Yeah. That's tremendous, and I also want to say thank you for your assistance and help with the funding for the Hilton Head Island Airport. As you know, that's a, certainly an in in integral part of our uh, tourism base, as well mm -hmm. as our residents' quality of life. So thank you for that. Yeah. We no, have absolutely. absolutely. We have, we have a couple of questions for you, if you have time for those. Yeah, and the first sure one's do. coming from Frank, and Frank is wanting to know what Two of your top priorities priorities are for 2023? Well, in, inflation has got to be a priority for us. And I would love to say we're going to balance the budget in the first six months, but that's not happening. If it were me and I could wave my magic wand, I would force the federal government to do what businesses were forced to do during COVID-19 was to make cuts and look at their spending um, because we have a lot of fraud. We have a lot of abuse. We have a lot of wasteful spending. And uh, that would be my number one issue. I filed the penny, the penny plan earlier this year that would balance the budget in five years and then increase uh, spending by over 10% every year thereafter. 
but I don't see that making progress um, at this juncture. I do know um, one of the things I wanna be involved with next session will be on supply chain and how we can figure out how to improve that. Um, also, I'd like to work a little bit more in supporting the DOD and defense. The Low Country has about half of all the military bases in the state of South Carolina. And then on top of that, about one third of our workforce are actually our veterans that are in this one third of our, excuse me, one third of all veterans are in the low country in the entire state of South Carolina. And so, you know, addressing some of those needs and ensuring that our, that our businesses are supported. Um, but we've got to, we've got to tackle the inflation issues and do what we can. Um, immigration is going to be an issue again, that it's affecting South Carolina. I talk to law enforcement all the time. I'm talking to families all the time. I'm reading about the drug busts that are happening. Um, and so that's got to be on our radar as well. And I was in a, I was in a meeting yesterday and I'm toying with the idea of looking at a tourist and excuse me, uh, uh, immigration visas and working on some legislation to improve, uh, access to visas, especially for seasonal workers. Um, that's an issue that I hear about a lot from Beaufort County, but also throughout the entirety of the Low Country. That is an issue that Congress has failed to address and trying to find a pragmatic, reasoned way uh, forward without it being too controversial and trying to get conservatives to support increasing some of those caps and uh, getting Democrats on board as well. So that's something that I started exploring, exploring yesterday with some of my more pragmatic centrist colleagues, and we're, we're I'm potentially uh, doing something in that regard, um, but I want to continuing. I want to continue delivering results. That's my number one priority. I want to continue the work that I started, and that means just delivering results for the Low Country, no matter where it is. Whatever we can do, we're going to do it. All right. Thank you for that answer. Next question is coming from Mark, and Mark is asking about the IRS has been greatly expanded, and what are your thoughts on that? Obviously, I opposed uh, that particular expansion of the IRS. One of the first votes that we'll have in the Republican majority will be to reject funding those 87,000 IRS agents. They're not here to help your business get your IRS refund. They're here to spy on your Venmo accounts when you spend $600 or more and your bank accounts, et cetera, which is, is not where we need to be going in this country, especially with the challenges, economic challenges and jobs challenges that businesses are having right now. But that'll probably be our first vote. That'll probably be HR1 is what I'm hearing. The rumor on the street is up here, uh, a vote to reject funding for those 87,000 agents. All right. Another question is coming from Connie and Connie's asking about the seasonal workforce being huge for our region. And uh, what can we do to get more legislation passed to help that to help expand that? Yeah, visas are a huge issue, especially on Hilton Head, especially in Berkeley County, also Charleston County. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, I was in a meeting yesterday with some of my more pragmatic colleagues on the right and talking about what legislation might look like next session to help address the issue. And so that's something that I will be exploring with my legislative team to see, you know, you can't go too far with it. You can't have some massive comprehensive bill. It'll never pass, but looking at ways that we can make some small adjustments so that businesses employment needs can be met. All right, thank you for that. Uh, I wanna also thank you for your, your team from, from the team here at the chamber on the responsiveness of your staff uh, mm -hmm. is really, really top notch. And that's not just coming from me while I've been sitting here. Also, mm -hmm. I've gotten a couple of a uh, couple text messages in saying thank thank the congresswoman for the responsiveness of her staff. So thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, I'm going to show off Jackson over here. I don't, some of y'all know Jackson. He's now he's moved to D.C. He's moving on up in the world, but he did a fantastic job. Um, it, down there in Hilton Head working with y'all. We love him to death, uh, but you're having a good time up here, right? Yes, he's working, he's working so hard, but it's, it's guys like Jackson. They just work so hard for the low country. And I'm just uh, thrilled to have them here and grateful for how hard that they work for each and every one of you. We're glad Jackson's with you. We miss him here, but we know he's doing great yeah. things with you in Washington. Yeah, he is. He's a 24 seven nonstop. He's been great. Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Happy holidays and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. Y'all have a good one. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.
All right. As we move a little bit closer to home now, let's find out what the latest happenings are on the economic development front here in Beaufort County. And Charlie Stone is the senior project manager with, manager with the Beaufort County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, he and John O'Toole work closely with the South Carolina Department of Commerce uh, to bring business not only to Beaufort County, but to the region. Charlie's also a proud USCB grad and a native of South Carolina. Charlie, thank you for joining us this morning, and we look forward to hearing your update. Thank, thanks a lot, Bill. Um, and, you know, I think I think Tom said it was a tough act to follow Santa Claus, but I have to follow Santa Claus, Tom, and then also Congresswoman Nancy Mace. So um, I think that is uh, certainly a tough act as well, but it's an absolute pleasure to speak to the group today. Um, and the Hilton Head Island Bluffton Chamber of Commerce has been just a, a great partner to my organization, Beaufort County's uh, Economic Development Corporation. Um, and as we work to recruit businesses and diversify our economy here in Beaufort County, we use the tagline, good for your business and good for your soul. Um, and I think that that tagline is really a great testament to the work that the chamber does, because truly our best lead as economic developers in Beaufort County uh, is someone that vacations in Bluffton or they vacation in Hilton Head or perhaps they own a, a second home in one of our communities and eventually they get tired of doing business uh, elsewhere in the United States. They get tired of the, the cold up in the Northeast or uh, in the Midwest or wherever they, they come from and they decide that they can move their company uh, here to Beaufort County and enjoy this wonderful area of ours. Um, and I do wanna highlight one project that we've been working with over the, the past few years, but uh, Tom Ruggi, owner of RX Industries on Hilton Head Island, he's really the perfect example of this sort of story. And I've had the pleasure of working with Tom uh, and Tom owns a, a high grade machine shop off of Finch Street on Hilton Head. And he's recently invested with his team around $9 million uh, in his project and is creating 13 jobs at his shop on Hilton Head Island uh, where they do precision machining for defense contractors, uh, as well as the medical industry and, and other various uh, industry sectors. But before starting his company on Hilton Head, uh, Tom was working with a company based out of North Carolina, and he used to tell people that his wife and kids lived on Hilton Head, uh, but he lived in a hotel room because he was traveling so much. He, he was always on the road. Uh, so he's now started his company on Hilton Head, and he gets to be in the area that he loves, and he's making a, a really big difference in our low country community. Uh, but it's truly the perfect type of project for Hilton Head and the Bluffton communities. And uh, I, I highlight it today because I think it's uh, really a testament for of the work of the chamber and, you know, really the types of companies that we're working uh, to recruit. Uh, our organization is working to recruit small to mid-sized companies that blend into the existing community. And we always say that the, uh, the environment's number one in Beaufort County. So we like to do everything uh, to scale. Uh, the Open Land Trust, as well as um, Coastal Conservation are great partners of ours. Um, and we're looking for companies that are environmentally friendly. You know, they're small to medium sized uh, and they pay good wages. And over the past four and a half years, we've been able to attract uh, just over $257 million in new capital investment and just over uh, 1,230 new and retained jobs to Beaufort County. Uh, and we're confident that we have many more success stories in Bluffton and Hilton Head that are going to be similar to RX Industries in the, in the upcoming years. And I'll go over just a few projects that are in our pipeline. Uh, right now, we're working with Billy Watterson and Watterson Brands on uh, two, two of their projects. And both are very exciting projects and both have a, a tourism component. Uh, one is an expansion of Burnt Church, uh, the Spirits production. Um, of Burnt Church, as well as a large scale food hall in Bluffton. And then the second is a production brewery on uh, Hilton Head Island. Um, and I actually have a call later this week with uh, Katie from Watterson Brands and their CFO to discuss some assistance that the Department of Agriculture is providing to those projects. But the, the total investment of their two projects is uh, around 30 million and 60 new jobs. So it's a a really big difference that they're making in the Bluffton Hilton Head communities. And we're working closely with Department of Agriculture as they've projected to purchase 
um, as Billy Watterson and his team have projected to purchase uh, just around $780,000 in grain from within the state of South Carolina, uh, as well as about $300,000 in whiskey barrels that they're sourcing from some of our partners in Bamberg County, South Carolina. So Billy and his team are really uh, doing a great job of working with uh, Department of Agriculture and looking for options within the state and supporting other businesses uh, in the state of South Carolina. Um, we're also working with an aerospace company that is looking to locate at Hilton Head Island. Um, the company is uh, projected to invest about $18 million and create 45 new jobs in an operation that would maintain uh, Cirrus jets. Um, in addition to these projects, we're working with a, a food production uh, project that's interested in uh, both Bluffton and Hilton Head, where they would do uh, food processing and distribution uh, and serve uh, restaurants throughout the region. Uh, we're also working with L3 Harris uh, as they complete some upfit at their Hilton Head facility. And we've also been assisting them with tapping into exiting military members. Uh, I was really glad to hear uh, Congresswoman uh, Nancy Mace speak on the importance of uh, taking care of our exiting military members. And that's something that we're looking to do at a local level. Um, and we're actually out at the transition classes at the Marine Corps Air Station about every other week. I'll be out there this Friday. And we work closely with the transition assistants uh, as military members are getting out and try to plug them into existing employment opportunities throughout the county. Um, Lastly, uh, I did want to highlight that we are hosting our 2023 Converge Economic Summit on January 30th, and that's going to be hosted at Sun City in Bluffton. And this year, we're very honored to have General Lloyd Fig Newton as our keynote. And for those that, that don't know, General Newton is a retired four-star general uh, with the United States Air Force, and he also is a resident of Bluffton, but it should be a great event. Uh, and attendees can expect a little bit more of an in-depth update on our activities uh, at this event. But uh, thank you all for having me and I'll take any questions that anyone may have. Thank you, Charlie, for that update. Before we go to questions, how would how would you like for people to register, register to uh, come to Converge 2023? Um, so we have registration on our website. So if they go to thrivebufort.org, they can register on our website. And then I believe we've also sent out a uh, sort of a mass email to our, our email list as well, uh, just yesterday. So, but thrivebufort.org, and then you should be able to register right off of our website. All right, thank you. Several from uh, here at the chamber reg registered yesterday, and uh, we're looking forward to attending. It was great last year, and I've also had the pleasure of meeting the general and listening to him, and what a fabulous guy. I think you have a wonderful keynote, so congratulations on that. Thank first you. Question, first question is coming from Robert, and Robert's asking, how closely do you work with the Department of Commerce, and how can we better compete with other areas of South Carolina? Uh, we work very closely with the uh, Department of Commerce. I was actually with some folks from Department of Commerce yesterday, and we were doing some uh, industry tours throughout uh, north of the Broad in Beaufort. We were at Geismar, which is a French rail manufacturer, and then we were at a glass recycling company, uh, and then also with a, a tier two automotive supplier that's moving out to the Commerce Park. But, you know, I would say that there's not a a uh, week that goes by that I don't have some sort of involvement involvement with Department of Commerce and, you know, truly Department of Commerce and, um, you know, our state government is really what sets the tone for South Carolina being a, a great place to do business. Um, and, you know, it, if you look at some of the studies of site selectors on what the top states are, it's consistently South Carolina, uh, Georgia, and uh, usually Florida's in there as well, but you know, usually those three in Texas, but those four states will be ranked in the top four every year. So Department of Commerce does a great job um, with assisting us at the local level. And then I would say setting the tone from the top and then it, it sort of trickles down. But um, in terms of what we can do to compete with the, uh, the rest of the state, uh, I would say that, you know, in Beaufort County, we're a little bit of a unique market. and 
and really we're very fortunate to have such a strong uh, tourism industry in Beaufort County. We're very fortunate to have the impact, the economic impact of our three military bases in uh, northern Beaufort County. Um, and I would say that we're very focused on uh, niche businesses. So we look to uh, recruit uh, clean manufacturing, green industry, supply chain to hospitality and tourism. Uh, in terms of competing with the rest of the state, I don't think we necessarily want to be like Charleston and reach the scale that Charleston has reached. I think that there are things that uh, we can do to um, diversify the economy. And, and one of those is uh, just making sure that we have um, industrial product uh, in Beaufort County. That's one thing that we've struggled in the past, but I think with some of the strides that are being made out in uh, Beaufort at the Beaufort Commerce Park, we've had a spec building that Magnus uh, Development Partners constructed out there that's 64,000 square feet. Uh, that's been 100% leased. And then we're uh, consistently working with Eric Greenway from the county and, and Jared Freilich from the county um, and Hank Admanson from the county to uh, identify other um, areas that we can develop product uh, in Beaufort County that we could have your, um, I guess, your more typical industrial park that people think of when they think of economic development uh, in the state. But, you know, we are also focused on sort of sort of those niche projects like the L3 Harris and the, the RX industries where you could tuck in throughout Hilton Head and Bluffton and you would never know that they're there. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yes, it did. Uh, next question is coming from Mary and Mary's asking how you got into the economic development profession. Um, I was I was born on Hilton Head. Uh, my family's from this area and. I, uh, I moved around a little bit. I lived in Dallas and then DC, and I'd always come here during the summers and I knew I wanted to move back to Beaufort County. I was always very passionate about Beaufort County. And I think it's uh, one of the most remarkable places that you can, you can live. And uh, we're very fortunate to have such a, a wonderful community. Um, I always knew that I wanted to get involved with something um, that I can make a difference in, in the community and in people's lives. And I think that uh, economic development is is really that because you know at the end of the day we hear about investment numbers and job creation numbers but behind every one of those jobs is somebody's life that's being impacted in a favorable uh, light because they've received uh, meaningful employment so that you know that's really what drives me um, I you know I was fortunate enough to go to University of South Carolina Beaufort um, and uh, really just started with an internship with my current, current organization, and I've uh, been doing it for about four and a half years now. So, Charlie, we're all better that uh, for you returning home and working on the economic development uh, projects. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at Converge, if not before. Thanks a lot, Bill. Thank you, everyone. All right. Well, as we wrap up 2022, I just want to say thank you all for joining us uh, all throughout the year. We're going to be back on January the 11th, hard to say next year, but January the 11th, 2023. Again, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays, and uh, thank you for your support of the Chamber of Commerce, not only this year, but all the years in the past. Have a great holiday, everybody.